start talking more about the marsh, I'd like to tell you how we got there, how I got to where I am, and Bob kind of knows that story. Um, way back in 1957, a group of conservation-minded people got together and they formed a group called the Sheboygan County Conservation Association. Has anybody ever heard of them? Well, they're a big thing in Sheboygan County. They have over 28 uh, different clubs and over 2,000 different uh, members, women, men, and some kids. Well, their big thing was they wanted to serve the outdoor community, protect and maintain the habitat, educate and provide opportunities for all to enjoy the great outdoors. Some of these members, they were like pioneers because way back in the 1950s and 60s when they first started, they did not have enough funds to even uh, mail their mailings. They had to uh, pool their money to buy stamps. We've come a long way. Up to date, the association holds a banquet every year. And that banquet so far has produced just shy of a million dollars that they have put back into the county in different projects. They also do uh, like wild turkey surveys. They donate to different organizations, and one of them is Camp Waikota, and uh, Maywood, they do trees for tomorrow, and a whole mess of other things. I got involved with the association back in 1992 as a charter member of a group called Tri-County Sportswomen. We're located in, basically in Plymouth, but we have members that come from Farm Lac also. And as a member of that club, our club joined the, uh, the Sheboygan County Conservation Association. And every club that belongs has two delegates. And you come to the meeting once a month, you hear what we're doing, you hear what's going on, and if the county association needs help or whatever, your clubs step up and help. Well, if anybody knows me or about me, um, I kind of have a tendency to get involved with things. <clears throat> Sometimes too much, right, dear? Yep. <laughs> anyway, um, through my course with the association, I served, and as of today, I'm still the only woman that's ever been president of that organization for five different years. And I'm really proud of that. Um, we did a lot of things. We started the stewardship fund in Sheboygan County. That was a change, but it was very interesting. Also, we um, formed a non-conservation group. And I had the privilege of working with the Hmong. And it took about maybe, let me say, three, four years before we finally pulled it all together. And they were members of the Conservation Association. They also served on the board. Another thing that the association does is they buy land. If there is some land that is for sale that might be adjoining some state land, and it's going to be good for habitat, excuse me, and conservation, they will buy it if we possibly can, and then we more than likely will turn it over to the state. We do turn some over to the county, but the primary uh, land gets turned over to the state, and it is there for everybody to use. One other thing um, we've done, we work with the DNR. And we support them, we give them donations, and we help them with different projects throughout the county. And we stock fish, we stock pheasants. Every year, about 2,000 pheasants are put out in the wild for everybody to hunt. We don't always tell you where they are, but they're out there. So, as you can tell, the Conservation Association used to be primarily a uh, good old boys club, you know, but then <clears throat> way back, like I said, in 1992, I think it was, they met me, and um, another lady friend of mine, Dorothy Bear. Dorothy was uh, an owner of a bait shop in Plymouth, and her and I went to represent our club at these meetings. Well, I'm happy to say that today, 
we have two women that serve on the executive board, and we have another woman that serves on the board. So we've come a long way, and we have a long way to go. We're trying to educate the youth, trying to get them involved in conservation, because if you take a look around at this room, you can tell we're going to need somebody to fill these chairs in years to come. And if we don't get our youngsters involved in the outdoors and in conservation, this is never going to continue. And before I turn it over to Sarah, Sarah does a lot of good things with our youth. And it tags off of who we are as a conservation association. Years ago, I can't even remember the exact date, um, they started a, a place in Plymouth called the Outdoor Skill Center. It's a log house that's on the fairgrounds property. Awesome building. The sportsmen, they built that. 4-H clubs helped. But in the long run, it wasn't sustainable that they could continue um, holding classes there. And they formed the partnership with Camp Wicota. And Camp Wicota is the educational part of our association. We try to do what we can to help them, and we do an awesome job. Um, another thing, the Conservation Association has won a number of awards. We've been Conservation Congress Club of the Year. We have been Outstanding Lake Stewardship Governors Award. We won the Wisconsin Wildlife Federation Award two different times, and also an award from the Wisconsin Outdoor Alliance Conservation Legacy Award. I mentioned that we won the Wildlife Federation Award. Well, as a member of the Conservation Association, that organization became a member of the Wisconsin Wildlife Federation. And the Wisconsin Wildlife Federation goes to bat to fight for our rights, not only in Madison, but also higher up. We try to preserve and do what we can to preserve what we have. And um, we also have started a group. This is the sixth year. In 2013, we started a group called Conservation Leadership Corps. We take students from throughout the, uh, Wisconsin colleges. They don't necessarily have to be from Wisconsin, but they have to attend the Wisconsin College or be a senior in high school. We select as many as 14 for the year, and we provide four different classes for them. We teach them on advocacy and how to write resolutions, how to go and meet your senators or your legislators, and how to speak before them. And then in April, at our annual meeting, we give them a $250 scholarship, plus during this whole year they got their meals free, their transportation free, and their lodging. And when we graduate the next class next month, we will have just shy of 80 members since we started this program. And I'm proud to say that three of the members have been from Sheboygan County. So that's very important. Another thing, with the Conservation Association, back in 2005, a group was called, was formed that's called the Friends of the Boat in Sheboygan Marsh. And we became incorporated uh, a couple years after that. But this group of uh, interested, conservation-minded, educational people, they wanted to do something that everybody could enjoy. So we decided we were going to build a tower. We built the tallest wooden tower in the state, and it's out at the Sheboygan Marsh. There's 144 steps going up and 144 coming down. There are four landings. Midway up, there are benches. You can sit and just overlook the view and just rest. And it's not hard to climb. The steps are enclosed, so if you're afraid of heights or anything, you don't have to worry about looking down and seeing anything you don't want to see because it's all closed off. Well, the Sheboygan County Conservation Association donated the first $5,000 to this project, and that's how we got started. Also, 
the friends of the Sheboygan Marsh, like I said, we were going to do this tower. Well, during the course of us trying to put this together, we ran into a few snags, like every other project usually does. We put out for bids, and the bids came back very high. And then some friend of our group suggested we become incorporated. Well, that opened up a whole new world for us. We were able to um, raise the funds, and the students that attended Sarah's classes out there had to write up an uh, article of what they thought of the program and what they learned. And two of those students happened to be daughters of uh, Reed and Joe, uh, Reed and Steve Schmidt from the Joe Schmidt and Sons Construction Company. So they reached out to us and they offered to build the tower for us for the money we had raised at that time and we could pay it off interest free. Who can refuse that? So anyway, like I said, we started with this project in 2005, and it seemed like it was forever before we were ever going to get that built. The big thing with the marsh, if you've ever been out there, you know it's kind of wet a little bit, and a little mucky, and um, the big thing was to try and find a spot where we could put the tower. We finally did, and we finally got it built. I'm going to tell you just briefly a little bit about the marsh itself, so that you have some idea of what I'm talking about when I say the marsh, and when Sarah does her presentation. First of all, the Friends, our motto and our mission is to promote the increased use and appreciation of the unique beauty of the Sheboygan County Bolton Marsh through education and recreation. Now, the marsh itself is made up over 9,000 acres of public land and over 14,000 of acres, including surrounding private land. A 141 mile, square mile drainage system drains down into the 60 foot dam at the marsh. Part of the reason for our cattail problem is that when it rains and the water levels get high, it tears up the roots of the uh, cattails and they come on down to the marsh. Now, this watershed is very important. This 131 miles is from eastern Fond du Lac County and it also goes into Calumet County, Manitowoc, and Sheboygan. So if you were out at the marsh right now, you would see how high the water is. If you've been on the news, you heard that Fond du Lac is flooded. That water all comes our way. So whatever happens in Fond du Lac County, the water will come down as 131 square miles and it will affect the Sheboygan Marsh. So if you go out there and you see these cattails floating around, especially like towards fall, part of that is from that. We also have um, peat out there, peat in the muck. Years ago, from, they tried to drain the marsh and they wanted to make that farmland. That did not work. And by that time, it kind of like destroyed some of the marsh. So we kind of like have a two type of a marsh. One that the duck hunters like and one that the hunters like. And it's hard, and the fishermen, I should say, and it's hard to manage a marsh to encompass all of that. So we do the best we can. And one thing I want to make very, very, very clear, our friends group has nothing to do with the marsh, how they manage the water, what they do with the marsh, the cattails, and we have nothing to do with canoes, renting canoes, or rent, renting campsites. That is all county stuff. We are strictly here to promote education. So, as I alluded to with the tower, we finally, finally got it built, and we dedicated it at Christmas time in 2009. So this year it will officially be open 10 years. Has anybody been out there and climbed that tower? Awesome. Wow, <laughs> I'm impressed. Okay, my husband knows it quite well because whenever somebody buys a plaque for on the step, he has to 
put it on. And he keeps saying, I hope we're not going any higher. <laughs> so, <laughs> with that being said, and that project being done, we decided we needed to have an educational building out there. There's a semi-trailer that sits out there, and that's been there since, I think, early 90s. 1996. 1996, that's early. Anyway, it's kind of like, you know, it, it's ran its course. It still serves, but it's kind of, we've outgrown what it can offer us. And it doesn't provide any bathrooms, it doesn't provide any safety, any shelter in case a storm comes up. So the Friends Group decided, you know, we need to do something for education out there. So I'll put our heads together and we have come up with a building that we are hoping to build. In fact, we signed a contract in June of 2012 for approximately 3,500 square feet of a new building with legacy architects. In 2013, we made our first announcement to the world that we were doing this through the Plymouth Review. We made announcements in January of 2014 and got the approval from the county board to build this multi-purpose educational building. The pictures are on my left. And in November of 25th, well, in November, uh, March of uh, 2014, we signed a contract with Joe Schmidt and Sons to be our, our, our uh, contractors to build this. This is a little more expensive than the tower. Um, and the longer it takes for us to get this built, the more it's going to cost. Right now, we are looking to raise just for the building, 2.1 million. Now, we started, like I said, we signed our contract with the architect in 2012. We are 401,885 short of 2.1 million to build the building. Then, we are looking to raise another 200000 so that we can start an endowment fund and have money there for the programs that the camp is going to run. First of all, we need to get the building built, and then the rest will come. They always tell me, you've got to have patience. I'm running out of patience. I'm getting older, and my patience are getting shorter. So, in November of 2015, the biggest thing ha happened to give us a boost. Kohler Company gave us a pledge of $500,000. They paid it off, and we've had other co big companies in the county who have also donated a nice chunk. Right now, this building is looking to be a lead building. A lead building is leadership in energy and environmental design. And like I said, we're about 1.5, 1.6 million dollars there. But we do need the help of everybody in this county to make this happen. And I will take questions after a while. But right now, I'd like to turn this over to Sarah. And she will give us some more edu education about the rest of the program. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for coming. My name is Sarah Desordi, and I wear a couple of hats when it comes to this project. So first of all, I'm a board member with Friends of the Marsh. Here is our Friends of the Marsh volunteer board. And I'm also the director of education um, with Camp Icoda Outdoor Skills and Education. That was our silly picture from summer camp. So my main responsibility is to develop and implement environmental education programs with schools. Um, so field trips, I visit classrooms, and I also do community outreach. We work with approximately 65 different schools every year, which totals about 12,000 students annually. We run our programs at different sites, which include Maywood Environmental Park, Camp Lakota, of course, and then the Sheboygan County Marsh, which I'll be 
focusing on tonight. So what I'm really going to be telling you about tonight is the program that will be happening or will be housed in the right side of the new educational facility, which will be called the Environmental Education Wing. So we've been running a program at the Sheboygan County Marsh for a long time now. The program is called the Wetland Ecology Field Trip. It's middle school students from area schools that spend two days at the marsh. One day they do land-based activities, which we will call the lab day today. And the other day they spend out on the water in a canoe. And here's a couple pictures. So as Lil kind of talked about the history, um, the program actually started with the Outdoor Skills Center in 1991. Then camp and the Outdoor Skills Center merged in 2000, and camp became more than just Camp Lakota, it became Camp Lakota Outdoor Skills and Education. So we have a couple of goals for our program, they're rather lengthy, so I sum them up in blue for you. Um, our main goals are that the children, when they come out, they learn about science. We also want to inspire the children to love the outdoors through our program. And we also hope that they will have a lifelong passion for recreation. All right, so I'm going to tell you about the field trip. So the first day the kids come out and they spend most of their day canoeing. We call that the canoe day. So they get off the bus in the parking lot right next to the restaurant. Then we cross the dam, walk through the gravel parking lot, and we trudge up the 144 steps to the top of the tower. So I've climbed the tower many, many, many times. Um, and I don't climb as fast as the kids, so it's pretty hard. I'm, I'm pretty much holding them back as I climb. I always tell them, hang on to the railing on the right side so that they can't pass me going up, because otherwise the visitors at the top get quite the treat of 30 noisy children surrounding them instantly. Um, but this is the view that we see from the tower. And when we get up there, the very first thing that we talk about is the history of the Sheboygan Marsh. We talk about the Native Americans that once used the marsh. Um, when you're at the top of the tower, basically what you're looking at is a really large bowl. It's 14,000 acres, so you have the highlands all around the outside, and then at the bottom is where the water is, so the 133 square mile watershed. And we show the kids that all around the top of the bowl is where there were thousands of Native American villages at one time. And we ask the students, why do you think Native Americans would want to live in a place like the Sheboygan Marsh? Well, it's because it was very, very rich in resources. They had everything they needed, food, water, and shelter. And plus, they could navigate by water. We also discussed the fur trade. Um, this particular group of students, they are from Kohler Middle School, and um, they, they were quite goofy, so <laughs> you can see um, the next couple of pictures, they're doing some funny things. So we talk about the fur trade. And we also dress up one of the kids to look like a fur trader. Um, this particular outfit is from the Hudson Bay Company, which is located in Canada. So the fur traders working for this company were uh, Canadian, French Canadian voyagers. Um, the outfit was really, really important because it identified the fur trader for which company they worked for. And you also have to remember the fur traders didn't speak the same language as the Native Americans. So when they were walking into villages or going to trading posts, um, they needed to be very recognized. I always compare it to UPS and FedEx. <laughs> when you get a knock at your door and there's a guy in brown, you don't have to question who he is. You don't even have to talk to him. You just know automatically because of his brand that he works for UPS. So it's very similar. We also learn a lot about science and ecology. So after we're done with the history, um, we do an activity where we hold up the pelts of animals that will live in the wetland. So for example, we have a muskrat, otter, red fox, and fisher in this picture. So we hold up one of the pelts, the kids guess which animal it is based on what they've already learned at school and which animals inhabit the, the marsh. Um, and then after that, we talk about some of their characteristics and their adaptations to the wetland. Going back to history a little bit, like Lil said, the marsh was unfortunately drained, so the Schwinn County Marsh is a restored wetland. Um, between 1870 and 1890, a man by the name of John Birchie drained the marsh so that it could be farmland. 
Um, unfortunately, by the time he was finished draining it, farmland prices had dropped so low that there really wasn't anyone interested in the farmland that he had drained. So he went bankrupt. And then between 1912 and 1821, the Sheboygan Valley Land and Lime Company came in and they attempted to drain it even further. So the big machine that you see in the picture, that is a dredging machine. It was coal powered. It dug over 20 channels surrounding the outside of the marsh, um, attempting to again take the water out of the main wetland into the channels, emptying it. Um, he, that company actually also blew out the limestone ledge, which is now located near the, what we call the Quashus Quarry, the old limestone. Um, and that was the natural dam. So when they blew that out, all of the water was no longer being held as a reservoir or as a marsh, so it was empty. And they actually ended up going bankrupt too. So in 1921, the marsh kind of just sat empty. So between 1921 and 1927, the marsh started on fire. Um, and that was because it's solid muck, and as that compacts, it becomes flammable. And because it's so large, there's no way of putting those fires out. The marsh during that time actually got deeper um, because the soil was exposed and there was wind erosion. It was compacting and then it was burning. So then they restored the marsh. And that happened when Charles Broughton bought the parkland and put in a marsh, or put in a dam. And I found this um, in the Sheboygan Press archives. Uh, the top picture is a picture of the marsh burning, and the bottom picture is when they put the dam in and refilled it with water, and it shows all the wildlife coming back. So that happened in 1938. So after they've learned about the history and a little bit about um, the animals that live there, it's time to canoe. Um, this is actually a picture from Canoe Day in 1993, and I thought it was interesting because do you see what's at the top of the picture? The yeah, the Goodyear blimp. <laughs> so I came across that when I was preparing for this presentation. So the very first thing we do is we get the kids' equipment. We fit them with PFDs that fit. We check them. We make them make sure they're on appropriately, um, and we get them paddles that fit so they can paddle. Then we talk about technique. Same goofy color kids <laughs> in that picture. Here's a picture from 1991. They're on the pier right in front of the restaurant, and they're dipping their paddles in, learning how to stroke. So first we teach them how to hold the paddle. When you switch sides, you actually have to switch hands. Um, that's something they struggle with, but they get their paddle in, they reach, pull, feather, and reach, pull, and feather. So we do that before we get into the canoes. <laughs> We also talk a lot about safety. So before, after we go through our techniques, we talk about how to load the canoe, um, our expectations, like no standing up in the canoe, no switching spots, no splashing water, and all those things. Um, we also talk about emergency procedures, just in case um, kids tip, which occasionally happens. I think in, I've been working for camp since 2004, and I've only had three or four canoes tip. So it doesn't happen too often, but it does happen. And then we go out, we paddle out into the wetland. And so I think the important thing about this is it's recreation, and hopefully the kids are enjoying it, and this is something that they'll want to do lifelong. And they're not learning with paper, they're not learning with textbooks on this day, they're learning hands-on. So while we're out on the water, um, we're trying to see as many different things as we can. Of course, that's hard when you have a group of 35 kids and they're fighting over how to paddle their canoe. Um, so it's not always quiet, but we still do get to see quite a few things. So while we're out there, we're talking about wetland food webs and the interactions that are occurring. And then sometimes we do a silent sit and we use our senses to listen as well as see what's happening out there. Other things we might talk about, depending on the day, is the habitat, succession, because succession is always occurring in our wetland. 
Um, the types of wetlands, we have three main types in Wisconsin, wooded swamps, bogs, and marshes. And then we also talk a little bit about the management practices of the marsh as well. We even eat our lunches out on the water. And that's so that we can rest our arms because once lunch is over, it's time to paddle all the way back. And since it's a marsh, a lot of times it's easy to paddle out, but then you hit the wind on the way back. So it can be a bit of a challenge. Once back on land, we do a few more activities before the kids get on the bus. Um, one of the activities is called the States Game. The States Game is a game about wetlands disappearing over time. So um, we use the states Wisconsin, Illinois, Iowa, and Indiana. And each state has a set that looks like this. So this would be Wisconsin in the year 1700 to 1850. 1900, 1950, and today, and those represent the amount of wetlands that we still have in Wisconsin. So in the game, we have the kids line up in a straight line and a starting line, and we tell them that they are going to be Canadian geese, or Canada geese, I should say. And they have to flap their wings, and if they're a girl, they have to say honk, and if they're a boy, they have to say hank. And then <laughs> when the instructor says go, they, keep, they have to keep flapping their wings and saying honk or hank, and they have to get to the state. So the very first round, we use all the big states, so 1700 to 1850. Um, and for that round, everyone can get a foot on the state. So it's kind of like they migrated, landed in the wetland, and there's food, water, and shelter for each of them, so they survive. But then we get to the next round, and the state gets a little bit smaller. So again, we start on the starting line, I will go, they have to run, they have to find their state and get a foot on it. But the kid that doesn't get a foot on it doesn't have enough food, water, or shelter. So there's not enough carrying capacity, so they actually have to go to goose heaven at that point. <laughs> and then we have another round, and we get to 1950, and finally we get to the fourth round. But what that represents, and we ask the kids actually what it represents, and they're able to tell us. Wetlands are getting smaller, and they can't support as many animals. And if you take a look at this map, Wisconsin has lost between 40 and 60% of their wetlands since the 1780s, which is the green. Um, the ones that have lost the most are the dark blue, or the least is the dark blue, and the most is red. So at the end of the day, we sit down and we kind of digest everything that we've talked about. And the kids talk about how they feel about wetlands um, decreasing and what they might be able to do to reverse the trend. Then we get them on the bus <laughs> and the teachers tell us that this is what happens. <laughs> So they go home, they get a good night's rest, and then they come back the next day for the lab day. All right, so for the canoe part of the program, we met all of those goals. They learned about science. We hopefully inspired them to want to canoe or be out, outside again, and hopefully we've um, instilled a lifelong love for recreation. Okay, so the lab day. The lab day, we get off the bus and the very first thing we do is take off our shoes and we put on boots. So our program is experiential, so again, they're not using worksheets or textbook. They are actually going to be getting their feet wet and their hands dirty. <laughs> and my hands always get dirty too, which is why I never ever get manicures, because they only last about a day. <laughs> So one of the things we do is we take a look at wetland soil. Um, wetland soil is very, very unique. So we head out into the marsh. We give each kid a piece of soil, and we have them look through it, smell it, and squeeze it. And what they find is that wetland soil has a very strong odor. And if you go out to the marsh in summer, you can smell it. 
It's a very, very strong smell. They find that it's very dark in color. It's definitely different than the soil that they have at home or they have at school. It's almost black in color. Um, the particle size is very, very fine. So if you rub it in your fingers like this, you don't feel anything grainy. It's actually very silky. And that's because it's silt. It's rich with vitamins and minerals, which support lots and lots of vegetation, which is why when you go to a marsh, it's so densely vegetated. And then the really cool thing about wetland soil is it acts like a sponge. It absorbs water. And that's why we have the kids squeeze the wetland soil, because water should come out. And they're always very amazed at how much water is coming out. Even years when we're in a drought, you squeeze the wetland soil, and there's still some water that will come out. One acre of wetland soil can hold up to 1.5 million gallons of water. And we have 14,000 acres of the Chemin County Marsh. So I can't do the math, but if you take 14,000 times 1.5 million gallons, that's a lot of water. So when we're still in the soil, area, soil study area, um, we actually dig a hole. We let the kids do it so they can see how much water is in that soil. And like I said, even if it's a drought year, we can find water. That's the amazing thing about wetland soil is maybe it's not full in a drought year, but it still has water in it, and it's slowly releasing water to maintain at least some kind of water level in the marsh and the Schwagen River. Then as a group, we jump up and down as hard as we can. And you can actually see the vegetation moving in waves because there's so much water in that soil. It feels like a trampoline. <coughs> then we take the kids and we take them into the wooded swamp and we give them all their very own spot to just take a little bit of time to do some nature journaling. Um, this has been very challenging for some of the schools that we work with because they're very urban and they haven't been in nature before. So being alone in the woods is actually very scary to them. So as instructors, we keep walking up and down the trail just making sure that they're okay. Um, they have a hard time sitting because they're not okay with sitting on the grass or a log or a rock, but they get to it. But by the time they come out 20 minutes later, they have seen so many cool things that they're very, very excited. We hear all kinds of stories like, I saw this and I saw that and I saw this plant and what's this? And it's, it's very, very, very um, cool to watch. Um, we give them the choice. They can draw what they're seeing. They can make a diagram of what they're seeing. They can just write down words, descriptions. Um, I've even had kids write songs about what they were seeing um, and poems. And at the end, they're able to share their observations and when we stand in a circle and we share, every kid has a different observation. So we're able to say at the end of that time that the marsh is very diverse with vegetation and wildlife. And this is a groundhog that stuck around for a couple of years um, in this area. And if the kids were quiet enough, they would actually come out and kind of walk around by them. So. <laughs> I put the kids that had a really hard time listening and <laughs> sitting still where I knew the groundhog would be because I knew that they would be as quiet as they could so they'd get the chance to see it. And they usually did. All right, so the next thing that we do is we play a game called Fish and Critter. Now, this game is very, very simple. There's no equipment required, and it's kind of like the combination of hide and go seek and red light, green light. It's a game about predator and prey. One person is the fish, and all the rest of the kids are the critters. When I say critters, what I mean is macroinvertebrates, so the little tiny critters that are living in the wetland. So this is basically um, a game where they're pretending that they're in a wetland. So down here we have the fish, who is the predator, and then up here we have all of the critters standing on the starting line, and the instructor standing in the middle. The fish has their back to the critters, and then when I yell go, all the critters run towards the fish, and then we all freeze. So the kids slam on the brakes, and then their job is to figure out a strategy to survive because the fish is going to turn around and if they can recognize that child, they'll say their name and their shirt color. 
If they say their names are color, they have to go back to the beginning. The very first round, the kids are really bad at it. <laughs> um, but by the time we get to the third or fourth round, they're very good at it. And that's important because the next thing that we're going to do is go and try to catch these macroinvertebrates in the water. And one of the misconceptions that the kids always have is that these little critters are just floating around in clear water. But they're not. They're hiding. So by the end of the game, the kids get, if they lay on the ground, they're more likely to survive than if they're just standing up facing the fish. They also know to look at the plants because they know that they're going to blend in with the plants. So next we put on, well we already have our boots on, but we grab our nets and we grab our buckets and we head to the shallow edge of the marsh where they try to catch these macroinvertebrates. And here's what they look like. Um, most of these macroinvertebrates are insects starting their life in a wetland. So we have dragonfly larva, soldierfly, um, caddisfly, scud, all kinds of things. So they're doing exactly that. They're looking through plants, they're looking on the bottom of the wetland, they're turning over rocks, and they're trying to catch these critters. So then we take a quick break for lunch, and after that we head to our lab. And inside the lab we take our bucket of critters, we pour them into dish pans, and we catch them with pipettes and spoons and sort them into ice cube trays. We take a look at their characteristics under the microscope. So we want to know do they have six legs, eight legs, um, red eyes, a white back, wings, tails, because then we go to a dichotomous key. So here's the dichotomous key, and it's, it's separated by um, characteristics. So up here you have no legs, so your muscles, your snails, and then you get down to your things with lots of legs, wings, tails, etc. The kids write down um, what they found, and that's very important because these macroinvertebrates are assigned a value. If they can only live in pristine conditions, they are assigned number four. If they can live in conditions with just a little bit of pollution, they're assigned a number three. And then it goes down to a two and a one. So you want to see critters that have the four value, because then that tells the kids that we have good water quality at the marsh. Um, so that's called your biotic index score. And it's either going to be excellent, good, fair, or poor. We typically see fair at the marsh. And we have a 133 square mile watershed, so there's a lot of things happen happening on the land in that watershed, and so we see that in our macroinvertebrates. We tend not to find those number four valued critters. And then we dress the kid up to look like a beaver. <laughs> Um, so we're talking about adaptations for this part, how beaver and other animals are very adapted to wetland environments. So um, this kid right here, he's got a fur coat on to represent the fur, um, flippers for web feet, goggles for the clear eyelids that they have, um, ear muffs for their ear flaps, a hatchet for their teeth, no trespassing is the scent that they spray their territorial, so they spray scent. And these are all the things that we hope they take away at the end of the field trip altogether. I'm not going to read all of them for you, because it's a lot. Um, but teachers do assess the kids when they get back to the classroom with either a test or a project so that they can ensure that this is the knowledge the students are gaining as a result of the two-day field trip. And again, after the lab day, we've still met all of our goals. They've learned science. We've hopefully inspired them to love the outdoors, and hopefully they'll love um, recreation for life. So the program today, um, for this school year, 2019-2020, um, we will have approximately 1,600 kids, fifth through eighth grade, from area schools that will be attending the field trip. From 21 different schools in three different counties, and of course, with each passing year, we hope to continue to increase that number. 
here's a graph that I put together from 1991 when the program started with the Outdoor Skills Center to 2025 where our goal would be there. So in 1991, uh, the pilot year with Plymouth, uh, it was Riverview Middle School, that was the first school out there, um, they had around 60 kids. Um, by 2000, we were over 1,000. 2019, we'll have about 1,600. And then 2025, we hope to have around 2,000. So the evolution of the lab. Um, in 1991, when the Outdoor Skills Center started this program, this was their lab, a tent that looked just like this. So that was easy for 60 kids. But then as the numbers grew, it evolved to this, the trailer that Lil told you about earlier. This trailer was donated by Sergeno, and then um, other individuals and companies um, gave funds to make the inside look like a lab. And here's the bathrooms. <laughs> and we don't have enough storage, so we use the canoe trailer for storage. This is what it looks like on the inside. So it's really neat. But as we've increased our numbers and class sizes have gotten bigger, we don't exactly fit in the trailer all that well. So the top picture, that's kind of what it looks like when everybody's sitting down, but it's still a tight squeeze. <laughs> and when there's movement, it's a very tight squeeze. And a lot of times, I will go up the front steps and go into the lab, and if a kid in the back has a question, I go down the steps, around the outside, and up the back steps to address that question. So why do we need a new facility? More room to be able to accommodate increasing student numbers. Um, class sizes are getting bigger, so in 1991, the class sizes were maybe around 20. Today, they're up above 30. Plus, we need an ADA facility for all students. There's steps that go into the trailer. So when we have special needs students that come out, if they're in a wheelchair, um, it is very difficult to accommodate that student. And we need better bathroom facilities for all students as well. So the other wing of the building will be shower and bathroom facilities. No more portable toilets. And just a general need in society today, we need to get children into nature. Again, we need to help them reconnect. We have a lot of this going on and not very much of this. So our hope is that by having kids come out to this program, we've maybe inspired them to go outside a little bit more, visit the marsh again, and so on. Um, for my master's, I did a little bit of research on children and the time that they spend outside daily, and the average in Wisconsin is seven minutes per child. So for me as a kid, I was outside all the time, so that's very foreign. How many of you have read Last Child in the Woods? So the author, Richard Louvre, um, great book to read if you're interested in this topic. But he says, reconnection to the natural world is fundamental to human health, well-being, spirit, and survival. And he's right. So we believe that with this facility that we can accomplish, we can meet all of those needs and get kids into the outdoors. <coughs> So a good quote by George Eliot, we could never have loved the earth so well if we had no childhood in it. Children that visit nature will forever enjoy value and advocate for nature as adults. And I am a good example of that. <laughs> so here I am when I was 18 months old, 1979, visiting three lakes. And here I am in 2017, driving the Ben Sullivan. I didn't do a good job, though. <laughs> I went that way, and then that way, and then that way. The guy in the black, he actually, he was laughing pretty hard. <laughs> I just could not figure it out. 
So here I am again, fishing in 1978. My dad took a stick and put fishing line on the end. That was the year, well actually that was the weekend that I didn't use my nook anymore. <laughs> so <laughs> instead, <laughs> I was addicted to my fishing pole, which hasn't changed because here I am in 2016 hook and line sturgeon fishing. So if you do it as a child, you'll do it as an adult. And that's it, the mock stops here. <laughs> I have a question for Sarah. Um, when you were at one of the schools in Sheboygan, and you asked them if any of them had been to Lake Michigan? Oh, yes. Um, so in 2012, I believe, we were at Grant Elementary School. Grant Elementary School is maybe two or three blocks. Yeah, how many? Five? Okay, from Lake Michigan. Um, Kendra and I actually had asked the students in the classroom how many had been to Lake Michigan. How many do you think? What percentage? 25%. So, as part of my master's research, too, I kind of discovered that kids in urban areas don't really venture outside of their block. It's just very common to stay inside, and if they do go outside, they don't go far. So that just kind of demonstrates really the, the dire need to get kids out into nature. Also, we build this new building. They will be able to offer more classes than what they do now. They'll have the capability of offering some evening classes and even the classes for adults. So this building says it's multi-purpose. That's exactly what we're planning it to be. As you'll see on this poster, there are four layouts of different ways that they can do their classroom or they can set it up if we're going to have a meeting. If you want to have a small party out there, a small wedding or whatever, this stuff can be rearranged to suit whatever the occasion. It's going to have a small kitchenette so that if you want to um, cater, have food catered in, there will be a refrigerator and a microwave. You'll have that capability. Also, the atrium. In the middle of the two sides, the atrium will be having a live tree from the marsh in the center. Also, the um, support beams will be logs that have been harvested from the marsh for the building. It's education, so we're trying to make it as educational as possible with items from the marsh. Um, we're going to be looking at a nature garden once we get everything set up. And in case you're wondering roughly where this is going to be built, God willing, and nothing else happens, we are hoping to build it south of where the playground area is right now, up more to the east on high ground. Not a lot of high ground, but we're hoping we found the right spot. So if all goes well, we are hoping to break ground maybe in April or May. Um, the longer we put it off, the more expensive it's going to be. And like I said, we started this in 2012. Um, I have some brochures up here if anybody would like to take one. If anybody is interested in donating, there's information in the brochures as to what you can do or wherever or what. And um, if you donate dollar, thousand dollars, whatever, your name will be recognized in the building. So again, you know, we're here to take your dollars. <clears throat> Sarah had on one of her um, videos, pictures about children handicapped. This goes back to the Sheboygan County Conservation Association. They have a track chair. And this chair can be used by anybody. You do not have to be a member of a club or the association. You can be a youth if you have a handicapped person and you just want to get them out for the day. There's information on here of where to call. It's housed in Sheboygan Falls and right now it is not getting enough use. So anybody interested, come up and see the poster and take down the necessary information. 
You can use it for hunting. If you just want to go out to the beach or something, you can use it. It's on a trailer. All you gotta do is call, sign up for when you want it, and if it's not spoken for already on that day, it's yours. Come hook it up on your vehicle, take it for the day or whatever, and then bring it back. So it's there for your use. What, what is that pushed, or is it motorized? Or? It's motorized. Mm -hmm. It's on like a, what do you call it, uh, a belt type track. 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 And um, it is motorized. Nobody's going to push it. No. <laughs> yeah. So if anybody's interested, come up, come up and look at it. And right now, does anybody have any questions for us? Yes. Uh, those classes, what months do they take place? So the classes take place in September, October, the beginning of November, and then the end of April, all of May, and the beginning of June. So it's nice outside. <laughs> Yes. Within the marsh, there was a lake called Lake Sheboygan, mm -hmm. larger than Elkhart Lake, yeah. these 300 acres. Does that still exist? Well, the main wetland, they still refer to it as the Sheboygan yeah. Lake. Um, but yet, thousands of years ago, Elkhart Lake and the marsh were all one big giant lake as a result of the glacier that went through from the, the meltwater. But does Lake Sheboygan still exist within the marsh? Mm -hmm. It does. Mm -hmm. Is that that channel that runs from the dam right straight yep. up? There's yes. Yep. Body of water yep. Mm -hmm. there mm -hmm. Yeah. So the first uh, picture that I showed you in my slide presentation was from the tower looking out. Um, that zigzaggy channel that went out, that's the Sheboygan River, and then it goes out into the bigger body of water, right. which would be Sheboygan Lake. Mm -hmm. And that other channel on the north side, that goes all the way to St. Cloud. It we, does. We took a boat mm -hmm. many years ago. Yes, that's called the North Ditch. This watershed also is very important. It drains into Lake Michigan. Um, this is one of the only watersheds that do drain into Lake Michigan, where some of the other watersheds drain to the Mississippi River. So the Sheboygan River water basin is a very crucial part of our watershed that you know provides water for all of us. And even with the video, it, it was very impressed to see um, just how much water, like you said, you can squeeze out of the muck. And um, if I remember canoeing out there years ago, and um, the first thing you said is, you know, if you drop something, don't reach over to get it. You aren't going to get it. And um, those were true words. So, anybody else? I got yes. A Uh -oh. <laughs> I am married. My husband is here. So, I don't know. <laughs> Anybody else have a question? I will come and talk to you. So, who's going to own the building? The county? The building will be turned over to the county just like the tower was. This is county property, which is yours, mine. And therefore, when the building is built, it's not being built with county dollars, it's being built with donation dollars, then it will be turned over to the county for everybody's use. Yes? Is it up on top of the hill there where the camping, or mm -hmm. did, that would take some, just a couple of the campsites? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, okay. Mm -hmm. Where the outhouses are? Yeah. Like, yeah. Sort of. Right. That's where the permanent mm -hmm. campgrounds yeah. were. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. I can picture them. Yeah. Yep. I can too if it gets built. I was worried that if it be kept where the trailer was, that's a wet. No, it is. Um, that's the one thing that we, you know, ran into. You're all familiar with the marsh, the way it sounds. It's wetland and floodplain, and we're limited to where we can build due to that. So. When they drenched it the first time, that channel along the road there, they put it all on the other side of that channel. They should have put it on this side, or I think they, maybe the BCTs and the mm -hmm. water mm -hmm. maybe afraid of that. You know, I think as we've gotten older, we've learned a lot more about the marsh and what could have been done, should have been done, or will be done. Our forefathers, I think, did the best that they thought they knew at that time. Just like with anything else, you know, they're doing what they thought was the best. 
And as years go along, you know, we see that maybe it wasn't or some parts of it wasn't, but we don't always do the best job either, so. Anybody? Um, the of the so the health of the marsh, um, I can tell you that um, after a drawdown, the wildlife is very abundant. When you expose all of the soil, there's seeds in the seed bank, and so new species can come up, and the more plant variety you have, the more wildlife it can support. So typically after a drawdown, the year after we'll see the macroinvertebrate population explode, and we'll see some of those um, category four macroinvertebrates, and the rest of the food chain kind of blooms from there. And then the further away we get from a drawdown, um, the less diversity we see. So we're very far away from a drawdown at this point. <laughs> so really, if you go and explore the marsh right now, you see 90% cattail, and that's not diverse. So you don't have diverse wildlife. Um, if you just look at the waterfowl populations, you do not see the diversity that you would see after a drawdown. So um, I think overall it's, it's healthy, but it can be better. And it's kind of hard to manage both for both. Because when we did surveys a few years ago, um, some people wanted it to be for fishing, duck hunting. The other ones wanted it to be for uh, hunting, you know. and. It's a diversified area, and it's hard to manage for just one particular thing. So you, we just, it's a marsh, and we're trying to leave it be a marsh. And um, we're talking about the drawdown. Sheboygan County has tried now, this is our second year to do a drawdown, but nature has not helped us any. And also right now out at the marsh, um, the gate at the bypass broke last year. And it took a while before they could get it out. It's not just something you go down and pluck out. It took a while. And then they had to find a company that could make the part to replace it. And then it has to be approved. And now, from what I was told by the county planning department, later this year it will be installed. So, yeah. This is about all I can say about that. Yes. A drawdown? Mm -hmm. That's when we try to drain as much water out of the marsh as we possibly can so that the cattails take root. Because the more water, like I said, it comes from fauna lack down. And with all this flooding that we've had, it just upsets and uproots the cattails and they come down to the dam. And then the county comes along with their trucks and they haul them away, and it's costing us tax dollars, like seventy, eighty thousand dollars a year to do that. People aren't always aware, but that's what happens. Lots of times that when I went out there, it seemed like the cattails grew on the moss, and they float. And then when the wind comes, it just blows wherever oh. the wind goes. Yeah, they do. So, yeah. um, because it's a hundred and thirty-three square mile watershed when it fills with water, it goes way up really fast. So if you think of the cattails having their roots, when you add a lot of water, it pulls them up and they uproot, and that's where you see them floating, floating down the water channel. It's hard to manage the water level out there, even when everything is working, um, because we don't have control of what happens upstream. So, you know, they always say crap rolls downhill. <laughs> we get the cattails. <laughs> so. Are there many problems with invasives? There are, mm -hmm. and actually the cattail is invasive. Yep. Yeah, so there's a native cattail in Wisconsin. Um, I can't remember which one it is. Uh, but there's, there's another one that came into Wisconsin. They have produced a hybrid, which is what we have at the marsh. And it outcompetes the rest of the native vegetation. So we have that problem. Um, we also see Phragmites. Mm -hmm. Garlic mustard, um, zebra mussels, uh, carp, buckthorn. So yeah, there's there's a lot of invasives. Anybody else? 
Yes. Just like our state park it used to be Terry Andrews State Park, and now it's Kohler Andrews State Park. You referred to Friends of Sheboygan County Marsh, but it's also called Broughton Marsh. So we're, what is the? We're technically Friends of the Broughton Sheboygan Marsh Incorporated. That's what our tax papers say. So. Oh, and by the way, I'll give you a little history about the tower. Um, we've had a, a, a proposal on the top of the tower, and then um, they emailed me and asked if they could get married on the tower, and they did. Beautiful day in September. I think it's like three years ago already or something like that. Um, we probably had a few other things on the top of the tower. Um, we've had... We've had uh, funeral services out there. I can give you an example. One day, usually when somebody um, orders something like a brick or a plaque for on the steps, it comes to the post office, and I get the mail at the post office in Elkhart. And I got this letter like on a Monday, I think it was, and it said, I need this step plaque, and I need it by Friday. And I'm like, oh. What do you think this is? You know, I got a turnaround time. So I contacted the person, needless to say, they were going to be burying her sister out there that, having her service out there that Friday. And um, we made it happen. And um, we've had um, anniversary parties out there. We've had all kinds of things out there. So, and we've had people from all over the world actually come and um, tour out there. Jim Bumgarn, he had friends from, oh God, I was in Australia, but maybe in the, I don't know. It was ways away. And they came and um, he took them out to the tower and uh, yeah, we've had people from all over. So, anybody else? Well, I thank everybody for coming and I hope you learned something about the marsh and about camp and about the program out at the marsh.